we want to set out on a journey. But as with every journey, we need a destination, we need directions to get there, and we need provisions to, to sustain us on the way. And as our title suggests, this destination is life, and the way there is narrow. But that alone doesn't give us enough information. I'm sure you would know from your own experience that you would research and plan a trip before deciding on a destination. You wouldn't just decide to go to a beach on the eastern coast of Australia and set out in your car and find a narrow road pointing east in the hope that that's going to find a beach on the eastern coast. You wouldn't do that without first researching to find that the beaches on the eastern coast are in fact rocky. They have jellyfish, stinging jellyfish and sharks that could kill you. And in fact, the states utilising those beaches are in lockdown. You see, we all know that we wouldn't decide on a trip before first researching and making the necessary preparation to understand where we're going, how we're going to get there, and what makes this trip so worthwhile. So our subject for tonight comes from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in the first book of the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew. So let's turn to Matthew's record of the Gospel, and we're going to begin in chapter 4. Now, as our title suggests, it was Jesus that said, the way to life is narrow. What did he mean by that? What is this narrow way? What alternative ways are there? And what is this destination of life all about? Well, those are some of the questions we hope to uh, come to answer this evening as we set out on this journey together. And to understand what the Lord Jesus Christ means here, we want, to, we want to first look at the context to, to understand what he's teaching about. So in chapter 4 and verse 17, the Lord Jesus Christ says to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in verse 23, he says, uh, we're told that Jesus went about Galilee, which is in northern Israel. He went about Galilee teaching in their synagogues, which is a Jewish place of worship, and he's preaching. What's he preaching about? The gospel of the kingdom. Gospel means good news. The good news of the kingdom. And you know, friends, that this kingdom that Jesus is preaching about is very good news. So let's join now with the disciples and follow the Lord Jesus Christ as he preaches this good news of the kingdom. So what have we seen from this teacher so far? We've seen that he's saying to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we can't continue living in sin, because sin will have no place in his kingdom when he rules as king. And secondly, we've been told that this kingdom is really good news. It's something to look forward to. It's something special. This is a destination that you and I want to go to. Well, now we come to Jesus' actual teachings in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. Now, these chapters are a transcript of a discourse that Jesus gave. So if your Bibles aren't yet open to Matthew chapter 5, then turn there, please. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 says, And Jesus, seeing the multitude, went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. So Jesus climbs a mountain, and when he's found a place to sit down, as teachers did in those days, the disciples gathered around him. He's sitting down as a teacher to preach. And what do you think he'll be preaching about? Well, maybe the good news of the kingdom, as he's already been doing. And that's exactly what he does. So in chapter 5, Jesus explains what kind of people are going to be there in his kingdom. 
And so then he explains how we should behave ourselves in preparation for that kingdom. In chapter 6, Jesus warns us about living a hypocritical lifestyle. He says, if you look for status now in this life, your reward is in this life and this life only. But if we try to please God, our reward is in his kingdom. He then gives us the very well-known Lord's Prayer. And that the Lord's Prayer details that this kingdom of heaven is in fact on earth. But so called the kingdom of heaven because the, the laws and values ruling this kingdom are given from heaven. They're given from God. He then tells us that we must pray for his kingdom to come. And then at the end of chapter 6, Jesus tells us that we must seek first his kingdom. You see, Jesus is telling us that this destination of the kingdom of God will be so good that we should seek it above everything else. And finally, we come to our title tonight in chapter 7, where Jesus says that it won't be easy going to get into that kingdom. It's going to take some effort. And he's going to explain that message by telling us a parable. And a parable is a story with a meaning intended to teach a lesson. So in chapter 7 and verse 13, Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. So you've got this picture of these two ways, these two paths that you could go down. And as we stand here at the junction, at the beginning of these two diverging paths, we would witness as as many people, crowds, go through this wide gate. And then every so often, one or two would separate themselves from the stream of humanity and take this narrow path. And so we have a choice. Which way do you want to go? Well, if you're anything like me, you want to first know where these paths are headed. What is their destination? Well, Jesus just told us where these ways lead. He told us that the wide path leads to destruction. And many go that way. And then he gave us the only alternative path, and it's a narrow way. And it leads to life. It's a path that not many find, and only few go in that way. And so we're left again with this choice. And it's not simply a choice of preference or a choice of destinations. It's a choice of whether or not we're going to obey what we just read at the beginning of verse 13 where Jesus gave us a command. He said, enter in at the straight gate. Now the word straight there is an old English word meaning narrow or tight. And it has the idea of being difficult to pass through with no room for deviation. You see, Jesus doesn't give us the option. He says, enter in at the straight gate. He doesn't say, I love you all, so choose which way you want to go. Live how you want and we'll we'll make it work in the end. He says, no, go this narrow way. It does end in life. And if you don't go that way, you will end in death, destruction. So what now are these two ways? Well, they're two very different paths in life. They're two conflicting worldviews, two contrasting lifestyles with two very different destinations. So how did Jesus come up with this idea of these two ways? Well, Jesus is in fact borrowing an analogy from the Old Testament. And you don't need to turn these up because I'll put them up on the screen for you. But if you were uh, quick enough to find the Proverbs, Feel free to verify these passages for yourselves. 
So Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 28. It says there, In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. <clears throat> Psalm 145, verse 17 says that God is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. So what we're being told here is that this righteousness is associated with a way of life. And that way of life is like God's way of life. And we're also being told that this righteous way of life does not lead to death. Okay, let's contrast that with Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So here, there is a way from the outset that seems okay. Jesus, as Jesus said, there's a wide way, and many go that way but it leads to death. And so it begs the question, why would so many seemingly rational people go down a path that is suboptimal? Particularly when it's a matter of life and death. Well, there are several answers to that question and we will come to them as we continue our investigations. Let's now look at another psalm. This one's a good one. This is a prayer to God from, uh, written by a young man who is looking for direction in life. And so he prays to God for that direction. Psalm 119 and verse 1. This man prays and, and, and praises God. He says, Blessed are the undefiled or the sincere in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Okay, so now we have this idea of walking in a law, meaning living a life in obedience to that law. And that law is the law of the Lord. Okay, verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Testimonies means witnesses or truths. And that seek him with the whole heart. So these are people that are obedient to God's law. They accept and are in keeping with his truths and they seek him without distraction. And it's these people that are blessed. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. These people don't do injustices to other people. They walk in God's way. And now the writer makes the prayer more personal. He says in verse 4 that God has commanded us to keep his precepts diligently. And now having acknowledged uh, God's commands and the rewards for, for living in obedience to them, the writer cries, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. The English Standard Version of the Bible says, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. So he desperately wants to be one of those who are blessed for walking in the way of God. And so he prays for help and direction to do that. Skipping down a few verses then to verse 33 to 35, the writer of the prayer then asks God to teach him his statutes. He then asked God to uh, give him understanding so that he could keep God's law. And then in verse 35, he asked God to make me go in the path of thy commandments, for in them I delight. So this way that we're looking at, this narrow way that leads to life, is now described as the way of God's commandments. So it's clearly not a physical road, but it's an analogy to help us understand how we get to this destination of life. Let's look at another Old Testament example 
of this idea of these two ways. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, when warning of the incoming invasion of the Chaldeans around 600 years before Christ, said to his fellow countrymen in Jeremiah chapter 21, he said, I set before you life, the way of life, and the way of death. And then he goes on to tell the Jews that if they stayed in Jerusalem, they will be killed, but if they went out and surrendered to the invaders, they would survive. So again, we have this idea of these two ways, two courses of action that are diametrically opposed and that will result in life or in death. And you would think that given those two options, it would be a very simple uh, decision to make. You'd think that the Jews would get up and go out to the invaders and surrender. But you know, life is not that simple. These Jews would stand to lose all that they had worked for in this life. Their homes, their animals, their crops, their friends, their national pride would all be, li would all be uh, left at the feet of these incoming invaders. And that was too much to give up. And whilst a few did hand themselves over to the Chaldeans and so did survive, many stayed in Jerusalem to defend the city that they thought was invincible. There was a way that seemed right to a man, as the proverb said, but it ended in the slaughter of thousands of Jews who stayed to try and defend their city. So now hopefully we've got this idea of these, these two ways uh, from the Old Testament. We've seen it in the Psalms, we've seen it in the Proverbs, and we've seen it in the Prophets. But you know, this idea starts a lot further back. It has its roots right back in Genesis. So if you'd come to Genesis chapter 2, right at the beginning of your Bible. In Genesis chapter 2, it's about the first human beings, Adam and Eve. And they've been placed in the Garden of Eden. Now in that garden, in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9, we're to told of two trees. And these two trees have names. There's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve are given one simple command by God. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou thou mayest freely eat. So Adam, you can eat of any tree, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So if you disobey and you do eat of that tree, you will die. So if, you've, if you like, we've got the tree of life and the tree of death. Well, in the following chapter, both Adam and Eve eat of that forbidden fruit and consequently bring upon themselves the curse of death. Now, there's a problem. God hates sin. And so he requires for sin to be destroyed. That was why if Adam and Eve sinned, they would die. But in the middle of the Garden of Eden, there still stands the tree of life. And if Adam and Eve were to eat of that tree, they would live forever. And the problem is that that would make them immortal sinners. Sinners without the consequences that sin deserves. And so in chapter 3, God says that now that the man has sinned, he says, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And what's he going to do about it? Verse 24, God put Adam out of the Garden of Eden. 
and placed a flaming sword in the way to keep the way to the tree of life. So God prevents Adam and Eve from living forever as sinners. He blocks the way to life. And you know, this is devastating. Adam and Eve are now destined to death. And you know what's most devastating about this? All their descendants also have the same curse. This also means that you and I are also destined to death. One of the New Testament writers, when commenting on this terrible tragedy, wrote in the book of Romans in chapter 5 and verse 12, that as by one man, that is Adam, sin entered the world, and death because of sin, so death passed upon all men, because all have sinned. You see, as descendants of Adam and Eve, we inherit the knowledge of good and evil, and along with it, the tendency to sin. And what was the consequence that sin had on the relationship between God and mankind? Well, sin breaks that relationship down. And we've all sinned. You and I as sinners are guilty of, of breaking that relationship with God down, just as Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden before they were expelled. But did you notice that the tree of life was still there? God didn't destroy it. And neither did he destroy the way to it. He simply blocked it. He blocked it with a fiery sword. Yet thousands of years later, back in Matthew, as we were reading, Jesus is saying, there is a way to life, and it's open, and you can take it. It's open for you. You see, this is the good news. So, so how was this way then made accessible? Well, we won't go there, but in John's Gospel, in chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus tells us that he says, I am the way the truth and the life. So Jesus has made that way accessible. He died to open that way. He died to demonstrate to us how much God hates sin and we need to overcome it as he did. You see, Jesus had to put right what Adam had done wrong. Adam's sin broke down a relationship between God and mankind. It caused a breach that needed to be fixed. Incidentally, that's what the word religion means. The word religion is a Latin word that means to bind again. And it has this idea of, of fixing a breach. And because it was Adam who broke his side of the deal, the breach would be fixed, repaired, if you like, on God's terms. And so there are going to be requirements of those who, who want to put right what was broken down by sin. The Apostle Peter wrote in one of his letters, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 21, that Jesus Christ left us an example so that we should follow his steps. You see, Jesus has already walked this path. He's already walked this road. It wasn't easy for him. He had to die. But now he has life. And he wants us to follow his way of living. Okay, so hopefully you can see that this story that Jesus tells of these two paths is pulled straight out of the Old Testament writings. And it's about two different courses of life. So let's go back to what Jesus was saying back in Matthew 7. <clears throat> we saw at the beginning that Jesus was preaching the good news of the kingdom. And we saw also that this story about these two ways that Jesus uh, uh, is Jesus' way of saying that the way into the kingdom is not the way of the majority. It's not the easiest way. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Well, now let's work through the rest of chapter 7 and 
and see what he has to say about the conditions of entry into his kingdom. Well, in verse 15, Jesus seems to pick up a completely different subject. But with a little careful reading, we will see that it is completely relevant to these two ways of life. In fact, this is actually Jesus' way of giving us directions to the destination. So verse 15, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He says, look out. There will be people you come across in life that seem to be good people. They appear to be doing everything right. But in reality, they want to eat you. They want to, they want to exploit your goodwill. So these are people that appear to be walking that narrow way. So how will we know if they are genuinely obeying Jesus Christ or if they are, in fact, a wolf in disguise? Well, Jesus explains that in the following verses. So in verse 16, he says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Jesus says, The person's behaviour needs to align with the individual's professed beliefs. And so he tells another story, another parable, a story with another meaning. He says, You don't get good fruit off bad plants, off thistles and weeds. Verse 17, even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth, not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So what Jesus is explaining to us here is that the fruit defines the tree. A good tree is good because it bears good fruit. But if a tree was to bear bad fruit, that tree is therefore a bad tree. Okay, so now we need to make some inquiries to understand what, was, what is all this fruit about? And, and why does Jesus use this idea of fruit to represent behaviour. Well, the Apostle Paul's letters, letter to the believers who lived in the area of central Turkey will be helpful to us here. Paul in Galatians chapter 5 says that there's two ways to walk. And he labels those ways as the way of the spirit and the way of the flesh. Two opposing ways. And each of those ways has a code of conduct associated with it. Now just listen as I read you these two codes of conduct. And they're also on the screen for you. Firstly, the way of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are made known, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And note this they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, okay, so, so that's where this way of flesh ends. Now you may think that these actions are only done by the worst of criminals. And even society takes action against things like murder. But what about wrath? Fits of anger. They're a little more common. What about drunkenness? What about strife? Quarrels? What about conflicts? Envy? Have any of us envied another person? You see, this is a list of actions that none of us could claim complete uh, innocence of. This is the wide way 
that Jesus was speaking of. The way that leads to death. And many go that way. Now let's look at the code of conduct for the other way. The way of the spirit. That straight and narrow way that leads to life. That only a few go down. Paul says, But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. That's a very different list of character traits, isn't it? It's a far more attractive lifestyle, yet somehow so much harder to achieve. But did you notice the way in which this list was introduced? These characteristics are prefaced with the fruit of the Spirit are these. Isn't that exactly what Jesus was saying back in Matthew, where he said, you will know them by their fruits? Their character will show what sort of person they are. And the Apostle Paul continues. He says, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. And what he's saying is that those who have chosen to follow Jesus Christ, to follow along that that narrow way that leads to life, those believers have crucified or put to death, as Jesus did, put to death all the desires of the flesh. So Paul is saying to display these good characteristics, these fruits of the Spirit, we have to have removed the attributes of that wide way that other way that leads to death. In fact, it's not just a matter of stopping those sins that belong to the wide way. We need to kill those thoughts. We need to put a complete stop to them so they never return to us. And so Paul tells us in the following verse that if we make those good character traits our own, we need to make that a way of life. He says, if we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. Make it a way of life. It's no good just to display love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc., just when we feel like it, and then turn around and get angry at the next person we see. That would be to walk down the narrow way when we feel like it, and then jump over to the other way when we feel like it. That would mean that we could change our destination in a moment. Now, don't think of these ways as going down in parallel and you can just jump, and jump back and forth and you're still working your way towards the desired destination. No, these two ways go in opposite directions. And the further you go down one way is the further back you've got to come to go down the other way. You see, God and Jesus Christ are not looking for premeditated deathbed conversions where the, the individual thinks that he or she can live however they want all their life long so long as at the last moment they, they turn good and then reach their desired destination. God wants genuine believers. Believers who are prepared to put in the effort that it takes to take that narrow way. Now, that's not to say that people, who, that people can't turn from the way of destruction later in life. If someone is genuinely prepared to put in the effort to, to turn behind, to, to leave behind them all the ways that are associated with that way of life and are prepared to take on these characteristics, these fruit of the Spirit, as we've just seen, they can and they will certainly be rewarded for that. So now we've seen these fruits that Jesus is talking about. It's all about characteristics. So it matters how we live because that helps to determine which way we are on. But is behaviour all that matters? Well, let's see what the Lord, the Lord Jesus has to say to that question. And we're going to take his answer from the third chapter of John's Gospel. In John chapter 3, 
Now, John chapter 3 is a conversation between Nicodemus, a high-ranking elder in Jewish religion, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 14, Jesus is explaining to Nicodemus that he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. And in verse 15, Jesus explains why. So John chapter 3 and verse, and verse uh, 15. And it's on the screen for you. Jesus says, I'm going to die so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life, everlasting life. So Jesus is saying we must believe in him to be rewarded with life. And it's not just life, it's eternal life, everlasting life. And so we've just added another piece of information to help us understand our destination and why it's worth going there. This destination is good news. It is eternal life. Well, let's continue reading. Verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So Jesus is saying that God sent him into the world to save people. But if those people refuse to accept him, then they have rejected the means of salvation that God put there, and so they will perish without hope. Let's look at another passage, this time from Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 16. There in Mark chapter 16, the Lord Jesus Christ is giving some last directions to his disciples. And he says in Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, to his disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not will be condemned. So here we learn that belief is a prerequisite to baptism. You need to understand what you believe before you get baptised. And baptism is a prerequisite to salvation. So now we're piecing together some of the directions to, to find our way to that destination. Well, a belief needs to be informed. It needs to have substance. And it needs to be well grounded. And we're going to see that in the conclusion of the Lord's discourse about his kingdom back in Matthew chapter 7. So Matthew chapter 7 and verses 24 to 27, Jesus tells another story. And this time it's a story about two builders who hear his teachings. And the first builder builds his house on the rock. Now that takes effort. It takes, takes commitment. And it certainly isn't the easiest way. He's going to have to work hard to, to dig down and uncover the solid rock below. He's going to have to remove that surface material. And then there's the second builder. And he takes the easy way. He levels off a plot of sand and builds his house on that. And you know, to the second builder, it would have seemed utterly foolish to put in so much effort to, to find and establish that, that foundation that the first builder created. But, but in time, the inevitable storm came. And the storm washed away the foundations, the, the sand floor of that foolish builder's house bringing with it utter destruction. The point that Jesus is making is that your faith needs a good foundation. And to get that good foundation, effort will be required. You're going to have to do more than be a good person. 
you're going to have to do more than just believe in Jesus Christ. You're going to need a faith that you have personally worked for and developed that will stand against the storms of life that question your faith. So tonight we've done a bit of homework in preparation for a trip. Our destination is eternal life in the kingdom which Jesus will rule over. The way there is tight. It's narrow. And only few go down that way in comparison to the many, the multitudes that go towards destruction. But whilst this narrow way is not the easiest, it is certainly worthwhile. Now all the directions we need to get to that destination are written in God's word, the Bible. And all we need to do is use God's word, use it to develop our faith, and we need to have a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. We've looked at three parables, three stories that Jesus has told in Matthew chapter 7. And each of those stories have two options. There's the narrow way or there's the wide way. There's the good fruit or the bad fruit. And there's the good builder, the wise builder, or the foolish builder. But did you notice what the wide way, the bad fruit, and the foolish builder all have in common? They all end in destruction. The wide way leads to destruction. The bad tree is cut down and burnt. And the foolish builder's house falls to complete and utter ruin. We skipped over a few verses in Matthew, which we're going to return to now. And that is verses 21 to 23. Because here Jesus is going to tell us that he is going to judge everyone according as they've lived. So he says in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name have done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So Jesus is saying, just because you lived what you thought was a good life, doesn't make you acceptable you need to do God's will remember this breach between men mankind and and God was caused by Adam's sin and therefore it will be repaired on God's terms there needs to be more than just good works you need the right faith built on a foundation that you will have worked hard for We asked earlier why, given the option of life and death, would so many seemingly rational people choose the way to destruction? Well, it's simple, really. Not many people are prepared to invest the effort, to invest their entire lives to follow Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible has a name for those people. It calls them fools. And that might seem like strong language, but given the two, the two choices, the two destinations, life and death, I don't think we could think of a more appropriate characterization. It's like those inhabitants of Jerusalem that we saw from Jeremiah when the Chaldeans invaded. They were given the option of life and death And because they cared too much for the things that they had accumulated in this life, they lost their lives altogether. They lost their lives now and they have no life in the life to come. Well, God is a loving God. And he's invited everyone to take this narrow way. 
and he will reward those who do with eternal life. But to take that way, you must completely reject the other way, the way that ends in death. Put in the effort. There's so much more to know about this hope. There's so much more to know about how we should live and what we should believe. And it's all contained in God's word, the Bible. Well, we saw earlier in the very first book of the Bible that the way to the tree of life was blocked because Adam's sin and the relationship between God and mankind had been breached. Well, let's conclude now in the last book of the Bible because here we're going to see that breach in the relationship brought back together. Revelation chapter 21. Now, it's easy to find because it's, near the la- it's very near the, last, uh, the end of your Bibles, second to last chapter. We want to conclude now by giving you a taste of the glorious future for those who walk that straight and narrow path. Revelation 21 and verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. There's the repairing of the breach in the relationship between God and man. And now look in verse 4. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for those things are passed away. There you go. All the consequences of sin are finished with. And this breach has been healed. It's been brought back together. Turn over one more chapter now to uh, chapter 22. These are the last words of Jesus Christ encouraging us to take that narrow way. And Revelation 22 and verse 12, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So Jesus is currently in heaven beside his father and he will return to judge everyone according to the way they've lived. Destruction to the many that have gone through that wide way and eternal life for those who have faithfully followed that narrow way. And now look at what he says in verse 13. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm the start and I'm the end. I'm at the beginning and I'm at the finish line. And what is between the beginning and the And the finish line, it's the way. Remember when Jesus said in John that I am the way, the truth and the life. Well, what he means is that God's plan to fix this breach in the relationship between God and mankind would be accomplished in Jesus Christ. The sword that was temporarily blocking that way to the tree of life at the very beginning of this journey was only temporary. It was only there until Jesus Christ opened it up. And now that way is available for you and I. We can all go down that way. And if you and I choose to take that way, then verse 14 is for us. Jesus says, 
Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. That's our destination. That's eternal life in the kingdom of God. Our prayer is that you will listen to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said, enter in at the straight gate. Thank you.